Hey everybody, I'm your instructor Linda Johnson and we're going to walk through the slideshow Rise of a New Field, A Brief History of Western Psychology and the Seven Major Theoretical Perspectives today. So on this first slide, this is an old medieval picture of doing some bloodletting to try to get rid of a strange behavior. Until, say, the mid-1800s, most of us did not think scientifically. We basically assumed that strange behavior like schizophrenia would be some kind of spirit possession. We had a much more simplistic framework, and we were not looking for uh, scientific causes for strange behavior and disturbances, but ra rather spiritual causes. So whenever we started to think more scientifically in the 1800s as a general population, we first began to come up with the idea that some strange behaviors could be caused by the mind. <clears throat> now, there were earlier thinkers like Aristotle, um, who wrote On the Soul in 350 BC, very early, which were philosophical reflections on the mind and behavior, why we think, feel, and behave the way we do. But they tended to be selective and of the intellectual elite. So the common people didn't really think scientifically. That was a really recent emergence, so just a couple hundred years old now. You can see on this slide that there were major advances in the 1800 that facilitated our thinking more scientifically. We have chloroform as an anesthetic. Can you imagine pre-1800s dealing with things like having your leg amputated without an anesthetic like chloroform. Uh, medical doctors became well established and it was took another like 50 to 100 years before they started washing their hands, but still. We had a lot of technological advances that improved instruments coming up with the microscope and the thermometer. Research labs started to appear and we have 1859 one of the most groundbreaking things that uh, happened in science is Charles Darwin publishes on the origin of the species and comes up with the theory of natural selection. In 1879 then, 1879, just before 1900, so you want to figure between 1850 and 1900, we have this transition from magical thinking to scientific thinking. And we're still in that transition. Most of us now are much more scientific thinkers than magical thinkers. Some aspect of our magical thinking that still remains is things like superstitions, things like that. But in, as a general rule, we tend to be, as a whole, already scientific thinkers. We tend to look for proof, right? Um, we want proof as, as well. We also have a dimension of ourselves that's belief or faith oriented, but <clears throat> when we go to academia, when we go to try to agree on something as a, like all humanity, if we can prove it, we tend to, all of us agree with it, and that is the scientific point of view. So in 1879, Wilhelm Wundt in Germany started, and this is a picture of the actual labs, and starting to think about that behavior is facilitated by the mind. Now, of course, this was thought about by philosophers, but now what's happening here, what the shift is, is that we have a group of thinkers that is trying to take philosophical explanations about why we think, feel, and behave the way we do into a laboratory, into a scientific environment where things can be proved, okay? and. Wundt's method was called introspection, which is essentially going in and observing and listening to some of the, uh, trying to observe and describe. One of the first tools of science is description, trying to describe as objectively as we can what we see. Of course, we now know that all objective objectivity is subjective, right, to our perceptual system, but still. Okay, so to go in and look inside and try to describe what the mind is doing. Describe what the mind is doing. So a rather simple method, right, but still beginning to apply one of the first and primary scientific methods to the study of the human mind and behavior. So highly noted for that. Um, in the U.S., we had Wundt's student named James Tickner, that's how you pronounce his name, who became one of the earliest professors of psychology at Cornell, 
And he expanded on Wundt's work to establish a school of thought called structuralism, which is in some ways very similar to a school of thought we have today called behaviorism. So we'll talk about that as we go along. And these are early thinkers that helped shape and develop today's mode of thought, which is the seven perspectives. So we're on our way to learning about the seven perspectives, which are seven theoretical frameworks that dominate the field today. Here we have a female graduate student, Margaret Floyd Washburn, who became the first woman to be granted a PhD in psychology in 1894, late, eight, late 1800s, right uh, at the turn of the century there, right before 1900. So she later served as the second female president of the APA and was very good at, wrote the animal mind, <clears throat> very good specialist at animal behavior. And that is still considered a seminal and foundational book for understanding animals. And many of us love animals like dogs and cats and so on. And, and she, she was a great student of our um, animal companions studying how they thought and behaved. We have another early American psychologist, William James, 1870s, United States, authored what's considered to be the first formal psychology textbook. And notice how he opposed Vunt and Tickner's approach, argued that consciousness cannot be broken down into parts and is constantly changing. It is William James who coined the term stream of consciousness. So because the stream of consciousness is always flowing, growing, and changing, you cannot necessarily try to figure its exact structures. It turns out that both Tickner's structuralism and James' functionalism approach are both correct, as you'll see. And these are early precursors to some of the major perspectives that we have today. And then we have Mary Whitten Calkins, who was one of William James' students, not allowed to receive her PhD at Harvard because she was a woman, um, where she was able to get her PhD at Wesley, which was a woman's college in 1905. So notice that we're still going through some of these transitions. Women even didn't get the right to vote until 1920, if you remember, in the United States. There's a great film on that to watch with Hilary Swank called Iron Jawed Angels if you want to know what it took, an impressive uh, amount of taking a peaceful stand, one of the best, most successful peaceful revolutions we've had in the United States, taking a peaceful stand that took a lot of courage against a lot of um, opposition. Okay, so now we have the rise of one of the first major schools. So you can write number one on here. One of the first major perspectives is what we're going to be talking about here behaviorism. And behaviorism rose directly from these early schools, right? And the essence of behaviorism is understanding how peoples and animals, like rats and dogs and pigeons, how, how live beings' behavior is influenced by their environment. How our behavior is influenced by our environment. Now, in the early years of psychology, they really liked behaviorism because it's very scientific. We can measure how hard a mouse will fight or work to get a piece of cheese, right? And since we can measure that in a laboratory and make predictions on it, behaviorism, watching behavior and seeing how things will change behavior, rewards and punishments, for example, is pretty easy to directly measure and watch. So that's why it became one of the early scientific schools of psychology. And since animal learning, our own learning and those of other species like dogs, pigeons, rats, mice, is pretty easy to observe and measure, behaviorism also became associated with learning theory. So behaviorism and learning theory are parallel terms. They mean the same thing. And behaviorism is essentially referring to how the environment shapes, conditions, or trains our behavior. And you hear terms like reinforcements and punishments come up on this. Now, we humans are really remarkable learners. I mean, shockingly good learners. We're learning machines, right? And we are constantly learning. And it's our ability to learn that, is, that has helped us climb from say, being very much a prey animal to being uh, the top here of the, you know, hierarchy when it comes to 
predatory and power, right? So behaviorists really focus, again, on learning and how we learn. And they've identified that there are three main ways that we learn. So behaviorists or learning theorists have identified three main ways that we learn. Those three ways are called modeling, which is watching others. Most of us learn to tie our shoes by modeling or watching others. And then the other two are operant conditioning and classical conditioning. So each of these has a slide with more definitions. Let's carry on. Modeling is learning by example, right? Copying. Okay, we learn an enormous amount from that. We can direct our own learning by choosing the right people to model. If we want to change our behavior in a particular way, for example, if we want to become more organized or more studious or more disciplined, then it helps to have somebody in our mind that we think about a lot and think about how they do things and then work to mimic them so that we shape our behavior. That's a behaviorist or learning theorist term to shape our behavior in a per particular direction. Now, operant conditioning is learning through reinforcement or rewards and punishment. And operant, they call it operant because the environment is operating on you, right? And influencing your behavior, right? So these two little lemonade stand kids, if people come and pay 10 cents for their lemonades and they have, they get reinforced, then they will probably try a lemonade stand again. But if they stand there for days and days and not a single person comes by and buys a lemonade, then their behavior is going to be what psychologists would say, they would call it punished. It's going to be extinguished or punished. It, it's not going to be increased the likelihood it will occur. When, when psychologists talk about reinforcement and punishment, what they're referring to is reinforcement increases the likelihood that behavior will occur. Punishment decreases the likelihood that behavior will occur. Okay, and it gets more complicated we have positive and negative reinforcement. And in these cases, positive means adding and negative means taking away. So we can add something that reinforces the likelihood that a behavior will occur, like these, you know, adding 10 cents and these kids making money, so it's likely they'll do a lemonade stand again. Or we can have negative reinforcement, taking something away that will reinforce the likelihood of behavior will occur. That's usually when with something when something negative is taken away. For example, you have a headache, you take an aspirin and it works. That reinforces that you'll take the aspirin again. You have a headache, you take an aspirin and it doesn't work, it doesn't take away your headache, then that has not reinforced. <laughs> it was not reinforced. And then we have positive and negative punishment. Positive punishment is when you add something that decreases the likelihood of behavior will occur. Adding something like, now you have to go write, I will not do that again a hundred times on the blackboard, right? Adding something, adding chores. Or negative punishment is taking something away that decreases the likelihood that a behavior will occur. That would be like grounding or jail. So you can see here we have positive and negative reinforcement and positive negative punishment. So punishment does not mean something bad happening. Punishment means reducing the likelihood a behavior will occur. And reinforcement means increasing the likelihood of behavior will occur. Now, we have a whole chapter on learning theory. So we'll go into those little details there. That level, positive and negative reinforcement, positive and negative punishment, won't be on the quiz this time. But because it's a complicated concept, warming your brain up to it now will help you really get it later. That's why I bothered to go into that level of depth right here. Okay, but you should understand that reinforcement means increasing the likelihood of behavior will occur and punishment means decreasing the likelihood of behavior will occur. Okay, classical conditioning is a different animal. Classical conditioning is when our brain tags something, all right, and it creates a reaction in us. This is PTSD, okay, so with PTSD and we all have minor incidences of PTSD that we get over. For example, having a, you know, having a car accident or a particular intersection makes us hypersensitive at that intersection when we pass it the next few times. That's classical conditioning. When you have test anxiety, every time you hear you're going to have a test, you get all anxious. That's classical conditioning. It's your body producing an automatic reaction 
because it's triggered by something. Triggered by hearing you're going to take a test and your body goes into fight or flight. Triggered that you're, you know, you drive by an intersection or, you know, you have a former boyfriend or girlfriend and you drive by their house and all kinds of feelings are stirred up. That's classical conditioning and that's, you know, an emotional response to a situation that is triggered automatically because your brain has tagged that with something. And we classically condition, we get classically conditioned on the positive too, right? After class, I used to drive by McDonald's and get one of those back when they had them. Soft serve ice creams that were chocolate dip. They don't have that chocolate dip anymore. <clears throat> so, but anyway, after doing like four or five times, I noticed that it was just like becoming automatic, that my brain was conditioned now to go get that ice cream after class. And I, I had to cut that out eventually. I had to, I had to punish, extinguish that conditioned response. And some classically conditioned responses now classically conditioned responses are automatic your brain has already tagged and paired this up so it happened automatically it doesn't you don't try to make it happen you don't think to it happening you can work your way out of a classically conditioned response but um like you know getting unstuck from developing the habit of eating too many potato chips at night or or whatever it is that we start doing automatically that is a conditioned response. And obviously, operant conditioning is involved in classical conditioning. Classical conditioning involves reinforcement or punishment. You know, it involves having something that, you know, positive and negative experiences. All right. So that's what the brain is remembering is positive and negative experiences. But they're automatically triggered by some kind of object. The example here is that for many of us, if, if, our, if we've trained our brain to tag noon with lunch, then we'll start to salivate at around noon, right? So when, we, when our eyes look at the clock. Okay, so two beha leading behaviorist theorists that you'll read about more in the chapter on learning theory, which comes down the line, um, but we'll introduce them now, is B.F. Skinner, operant conditioning, very famous uh, theorist who worked with rats and boxes to prove that you could teach animals to do unbelievable things and all you have to do is watch America's Dog Talent. You can see that dogs are taught through operant conditioning to do all kinds of amazing things and win America's Dog Talent. So, and they do this by step by step by step by step by step learning, you know, reinforcing the tiniest bit of behavior that moves toward a particular direction. And we can do that with ourselves and with the people in our lives too. There's some fun videotapes we'll watch about this about how to get someone to do things using operant conditioning and what to expect. Because people are a little bit more complicated than rats, so we're a little bit trickier. All right, and then the second theorist that you are going to be learning about is John Watson and Little Albert. And this is a shocking study. John Watson, like one of the most unethical studies that was ever done in psychology. Ah! Um, classical conditioning study. And what John Watson hypothesized was that he could instill a phobia in a child. He could teach a child. A child could learn. Remember learning theory, behaviorism, learning theory. He could teach a child to be terrified of a little white rat. A child that was not afraid of it at all, he could teach a child very quickly to be afraid of a, a rat. And what they're trying to do is here is show how much is learned, that even fears can be learned. Now, naturally, some of our fears are instinctual. We really know that now, you know. We have an instinctual vulnerability to be afraid of snakes and so on. But some of our other fears are, uh, are, are definitely learned. There are things that we learn to tag a certain situation with a fearful, you know, with terror. And Watson showed, proved how that can be done. So let's take a look at this video and and I want to point out today that today this would be uh, completely unethical and an experiment that would not could not be done in the early part of the 20th century psychologists John Watson and Rosalie Rayner set out to teach a baby boy called little Albert to fear white rats using the principle of classical conditioning this is a film of their work the film shows several phases of their study. First, as you see here, the investigators demonstrated that prior to conditioning, Little Albert had no fears of any animals, including, of course, white rats. 
So you can see the baby's mellow here. Baby doesn't have any problem with the dog. He's just and this was actually a super, super mellow baby. They found out later, like way on the easy, relaxed child department. So not not eliciting or showing any indicators of fears. This is John Watson. The baby behind him is his graduate student, Rainer. Here he's seeing the rat, and the baby doesn't have any problem with the rat either. Just relax there. Okay, so not afraid of the rat. Now what they're going to do is induce fear. Well, they'll show him a few more animals. This little rabbit. And again, you know, psychology is working to establish itself as a science. And John Watson was very uh, ambitious. Watson and Rayner then sought to teach Albert to fear white rats through classical conditioning. In the conditioning phase of the study, which was not filmed, the investigators struck a steel bar with a hammer whenever Albert reached for a rat, making a very loud noise that greatly upset and frightened Albert. After six such pairings of the loud noise and the rat, it was believed that the boy had been conditioned to fear white rats. That is, Albert was now expected to react fearfully to white rats, whether the rats were paired with loud noises or not. In this next film sequence, we see Albert interacting with a white rat after the conditioning process. The investigators believed that the child's reaction during this trial demonstrated his newly acquired fear of white rats. So he's crying and Finally, trying to get away. Finally, the investigators expected that little Albert's conditioned fear of white rats would generalize to stimuli that were similar in key ways to a white he's rat. He's crying here at the rabbit. In this film segment, they were trying to demonstrate that the child now also reacted fearfully to similar objects, such as a rabbit, a dog, a furry object, and a white mask worn by Watson himself. Not much empathy happening here, and and that particular scene right there strikes me as reflecting some very strange things about John Watson. Now, what happened here clearly was that these guys induced, Watson and Rainer induced a fear in the baby. Now, they, they basically created a post-traumatic stress experience, and so being a very young child, uh, little Albert associated a fear with the white mouse and then generalized that fear to other furry objects, but not so much this white mask, although it's very strange to go throwing that into a child's face. Now, interestingly, uh, Watson was fired for having an affair with his graduate student over here, Raymond, and he ended up going to the J. Robert Thompson Advertising Agency and changing the face of advertising prior to Watson learning and figuring out classical conditioning, advertising would focus on the object itself. You would see something like a, uh, you know, a, a bottle of Pepsi, and they would talk about how sparkly and delicious it was. But you would not see a bottle of Pepsi with the most gorgeous woman, et cetera, et cetera. You would just see the bottle of Pepsi. So <clears throat> this uh, change to tagging objects like a bottle of Pepsi with products directly came from John Watson moving into the advertising world. And again, we'll look at that more again on, uh, on the section on learning theory, on the chapter on learning theory. So if you remember, psychology is defined as a scientific study of behavioral mental processes. And Behavior, if we look at mental processes to, to be basically a catch-all phrase for everything from thoughts to daydreaming to fantasies to planning to strategizing to creativity to music to art. I mean, literally everything that the mind does. So one shorthand 
and very useful catchphrase I use for that is to describe psychology as the scientific study of how we think, feel, and behave. Think, feel, and behave, which brings the emotional c component into it. So behaviorists would say that we, the way that we think, feel, and behave is learned and conditioned by our environment. So our environment influences powerfully how we think and behave. And then what we learn quickly becomes automatic. We do it without thinking. There's a very interesting part of our brain that's always encoding information and putting it into storage so that we can use our working mind for the new information we have to face. An example of this is when you go to school, at first you really have to figure out where the parking lot is, where the classroom is, and so on. But by the second or ter third trip, you've got that down. Your brain has memorized that, put that into autopilot, so you can start focusing on who's in the class and the material and so on. So really amazing thing that our brain does, and that's autopilot, automatic intelligence that our brain is doing for us, right? And one of the ways that our unconscious operates. Now, a behaviorist term that you've probably heard is behavior modification, which is a therapy style that directly influences, it targets specific behaviors and helping people change specific behaviors, right? So if you want to become more disciplined, if you want to procrastinate less, if you want to become more assertive, you could go to behavior modification therapy, which really we could start to think about as coaching, right? Coaching to help us work with psychological characteristics that we might want to shift or change. And who doesn't have those, right? Okay, so what we've talked about so far is the history of psychology, some of the early history, just like a super fast run through. You can read that section in the book if you want to go into more depth on it. But what we want to extract out of this first chapter, the dominant paradigm you need to have implanted in your brain is the seven perspectives. That's what dominates the field today. And the early perspectives led to the first perspective that we started talking about surfacing and becoming very powerful influence, and that's behaviorism. And behaviorism is about learning theory. It's about how the environment, usually through learning, whether conscious or unconscious, changes our behavior. Our behavior adapts, right, and changes because of what we've learned. And that's a powerful environmental influence, right? But it's just one dimension. It's one dimension. So now we're going to pause. And this is a really good time for you to take a break. Cognitive load. All right. Take yourself a nice half hour break. And then let's jump into the next part, which is Freud. Freud and the psychodynamic perspective. But first, really take a break. I know I need a break. <laughs> 